Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the weekly Lender Fintech News Roundup. My name is Peter Renton. I'm chairman and co-founder of Lender Fintech. I'm here with my good friend, uh, Todd Anderson, and we have a special guest this week, Ron Shevlin from Cornerstone Advisors. How are you doing, Ron? Doing great, Peter and Todd. Great. To, thanks for, ha for having me here. Of course. Of course. Of course. course. So let's let's get started with obviously the big story that broke uh earlier today was robin hood i mean we were going to talk about robin hood's fine which was yesterday's story <laughs> <laughs> and now we uh like it's a little I, i'm the timing is interesting don't you think that uh they didn't they decided to go out with their uh, with their ipo release their s1 today knowing it was 24 hours after they were, in the, they, were they were on the front page of the wall street journal this morning Yep. And um, they said, yep, let's just go out anyway. It's uh, they are, it's almost like a, a middle finger to the, to the regulators in a way, <laughs> to FINRA saying, yep, you're not stopping our plans. What, uh, what do you guys think? I mean, I think regardless of the bad news they've had, um, you know, they've, they've kind of used that to their advantage in, in some ways. Um, you know, they've had a lot of bad news in the past year, but it's i think it's ultimately helped um you know give more awareness to the platform i mean they've you have almost 20 million users now um you know they grew um customer assets to almost 90 billion um you know they did turn a profit last year though they lost a, a lot of money first quarter this year um but i i think they've actually used the negative press to their ultimate advantage um, now, what that will mean going forward, now that they're public and they can be even further scrutinized, we'll see. But um, I had think, do think they've they've turned some of that negative thought in, into positivity, at least from um, a growth standpoint. Well, <clears throat> I don't mean to disagree with you, Todd, but here's the, here's what I would throw out at you guys is, uh, okay. first of all, I think they're totally impervious to the bad news. They This is hardly the first fine. It's more than the... Right. Uh, I who can even count how many fines at this point. Uh, you know, at the end of each of the past couple of years, I've done a winners and losers of fintech, and they have made the losers list both years, uh, mostly because of their business practices, not because of the growth. Um, so look, if they had postponed the IPO because of a, a fine, uh, they were probably sitting there going, well, what are the chances that we'll get fined the day before the next time we schedule anyway? So, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing, Todd, where, where I might sort of quibble with you a bit is I don't know that they're actually using the bad news to their advantage. I think they've got a market position that is, is very strong. As I said, you know, uh, um, 18 million you know, accounts. But what I found very interesting in the announcement was that they claimed 17.7 .7 million active accounts. Now, I don't know if that's out mm -hmm. of the 18 million, it seems, but that's an incredibly high activation rate or active yeah. rate. Um, and listen, there's, there's so much big Wall Street money into Robinhood that that's what's driving a, a lot of this. It's, um, you know, they do, I think, totally agree. They've got a middle finger up to the uh, rest of the industry saying, look, this is, this is what we're doing. We're going to kind of plow ahead with this. I will tell you this, I, I think that over the next couple of years, we're going to see a, a counter reaction to a lot of this. I wrote about this a little bit earlier this year, a uh, rise of what I would like to call the anti Robin Hoods, uh, companies that I think like Investor without the vowels, uh, .com, Wisest is emerging, um, W I Z E S T, that you know create more of a collaborative sort of investing model, a much more investor friendly model from a business model perspective. And I think we're gonna see a lot of attrition uh, in Robinhood over the next couple of years as these alternative uh, approaches emerge. And uh, I think a lot of Robinhood investors, first of all, kind of learn that there are some alternatives. But you know, another thing I would love to know about Robinhood, and uh, unfortunately there's no way for me to know it because I don't survey consumers less than the age of 21, but I think there's a lot of investors or in, in Robinhood's uh, portfolio there and their customer base who are like teenagers. Uh, right. And I'd be interested in knowing, you know, how much of their in, in customer base are, you know, below 21 years old. And not that there's anything wrong with that, except that, you know, very much like the social media world, you know, younger consumers are, are very attuned to the, uh, 
you know, the trends that, that come and go. And so I can definitely foresee a time in a couple of years from now when it's not cool to be on Robin Hood just as much as it is, is cool to be on Robin Hood right now. And I don't think that plays well for their, uh, you know, long-term success. But uh, that said, you know, listen, you can't take anything away. They've got a pretty ingrained user base right now that apparently is pretty active. And even with attrition, uh, they're, they're still sitting with a, you know, very strong customer base. And by the way, that 80 to $90 billion in assets represents an average account value of only about $4,500. Yeah. So there's a lot, a lot of room for growth with their right. existing customer base. Right. Just one thing on that, Ron. I feel like uh, I might disagree a little bit and say that, you know, they, they they are cool right now. There's no question the cool kids are all on Robin Hood and um, all the game, all the Redditors are on there, the GameStop people and, and the AMC and that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I think about Facebook and people are still like Facebook um, – have been hated for for many many years and yet they have this 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 dominance that no no company in in the history of the world has had with basically half the world's population as as uh, as users um and not and robin was a long way from that but my point is they can still be i think there's going to be better alternatives no question i think some of these alternatives will be better it doesn't mean they're going to get to the scale that robin hood is going to get to robin hood may end up being the facebook of the investing world and and maintain a, a strong position where most people dislike them but they still have the runs on the board and you know that it's gonna be interesting to see i think you're making good points peter i wouldn't dispute that at all yeah yeah I, i'm not that like I think long term, I think they are going to have trouble. I think they've used it to an advantage in the short term and to get a blockbuster IPO. But um, I still think they have a lot of issues related to you know the gamification and and how people use the app and and understand what they're doing inside the app. Because I still think we're looking at probably further lawsuits of people who've lost a lot of money in not really understanding what they're doing. I mean they they quote unquote do some education, but it's it's not real education on, on what the different options are versus maybe just trading a few hundred dollars in, in you know tech stocks or something like that. I think they still have some things to, to work out there. Yeah, yeah. And to that point, Todd, you know, what's what I find kind of ironic or perhaps uh, contradictory is that, you know, so many studies like to prove and show that younger consumers want to do business with companies that they feel are authentic. Well, how inauthentic is is Robinhood um, with its democratization claims and so forth? There's a there was an article in the, of all places, the Minnesota Law Review a couple months ago, kind of tearing down Robinhood's claims of you know democratizing finance and really being to totally the exact opposite. So here's a company that's truly not very authentic in its claims about uh, democratizing finance. And yet it is so popular with younger consumers. Yeah, it really is. A point, and it points out to that when they had the, the whole GameStop saga happened and they were forced to, um, you know, they were forced to kind of take it off, take it off and, and limit trading on it. They didn't, they could have just come out and said, look, this is the fault of a two-day settlement. We have to hold billions of dollars in reserve. We don't have that kind of money. If, they, if he'd said that right out of the bat, they would have been authentic. And it would have been, um, it wouldn't have done them any harm, except he just sort of, you know, he weaseled his it way out. It took him like seven interviews to finally get to that. Yeah. You know, he had the the five or six along the way where his story kept changing and changing. And then he finally got to to that point eventually. But yeah, I mean, that, that plays right into the in, inauthentic nature of Yeah, of, I don't know who's their PR yeah. advisor is, but they, they really should have had they should just blame this on two-day settlement we're in the freaking 20 we're in the 2020s and we still have two-day settlement you can settle on you know crypto currencies instantly but you can't settle on on stocks but anyway let's move on um i want to talk about jp morgan real quick here they uh they acquired Open Invest, uh, ESG investing platform. We had one of the co-founders on our, uh, speak at our event uh, a couple of months ago, and really, you know, I, I don't know a lot about this platform, but I do. I know that they they really enable investors to kind of just fine tune with all kinds of different ways to to really make the sort of create your ESG portfolio with really um, very, very detailed, uh, um, you know, detailed kind of uh, criteria. And it's, uh, 
yeah, they're, and they're young. They were just going out there raising a Series B. They've only raised twenty five million. Doesn't say how much they paid. I thought JP Morgan, JP Morgan probably got them pretty cheaply, but they're in. They're out there raising their Series B, and JP Morgan said, "Oh, we'll, don't worry about that. We'll just buy you." And uh, I mean, ESG is hot. Do you, have you have you been following this company at all, Ron? I have not been following that, but uh, the broader space, yes. And I have to say, I I think this is a a good move on on JP Morgan's uh, part, and I think it's kind of part of a much broader strategy. You know, you look at, uh, was it last week or even the week before when they acquired Nutmeg in the UK? You know, this is about them filling in the gaps in their wealth management capabilities, uh, you know, from a robo-advisor perspective, now from an ESG perspective, and, you know, covering all bases and, and uh, you know, expanding out their, their set of capabilities as much from a sort of general business perspective as much from a technology perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so not surprising that they would make this. I'm not familiar with uh, the company itself, but not surprised to, to hear this direction. Yeah, yeah, I mean, ESG is becoming a, a must have, um, you know, for, for many businesses. It's a huge trend amongst uh, younger people. Um, and I think if you're you're ignoring that, um, you don't see the the wave coming of of younger people being more um, you know attuned to to the various um, you know uh, ways that companies uh, deal with carbon and uh, investing in these companies. I think you're going to continue to see move, either moves like this by banks or just more companies coming up. Similar to what we see in the banking space of companies that serve different communities, you're gonna, you know, this this plays along that that trend of of um, you know finding that that niche or that that focus segment. Um, and I think it's a smart move by J.P. Morgan versus just letting the company get bigger and bigger. They just scoop them right up. Yeah, and uh, Jamie Dimon did say they were going to get more aggressive in their acquisitions, and we've seen, you know, two in the wealth management space in the space, you know, in the space of you know three weeks they had they had the nutmeg announcement i think a couple of weeks ago so also don't know if you guys saw a couple of days ago maybe it was but maybe it was this week who i keep losing track of what was this week last week or last year for that matter <laughs> yeah. um but he posted on linkedin a fairly lengthy post about climate impact and so forth and it was really about announcing uh a, a report that jp morgan chase had published around climate impact so to some extent, you know, they he, he and they are getting a little bit more activist about their climate impact. And so this sort of you know still has more of a business angle to it. There is some consistency in messaging from from uh, from Diamond and, and J.P. Morgan on, on this. So, uh, you know, probably totally unrelated in terms of the timing of that. But it was interesting mm -hmm. how there is, you know, a fit there and from an ESG perspective, especially from a climate change perspective. Yeah, I wonder, you know, now, I wonder if they're going to stop uh, lending money to oil companies or is that, uh, I think they're still one of the biggest lenders to oil companies, well, the oil and gas industry. Um, so they may, maybe that's uh, that's coming down the down the pipe. But that's a, that's a topic for another day. Let, let's move on. Um, I, I, we've got our, our now weekly um, update on overdraft fees, which <laughs> this is something that we, we've been covering the movements here. I'm actually working on a, an article. I'm going to hopefully have it published uh either by the end of the day today or tomorrow it's um talking you know based td td bank which is actually if you look at the article in american banker from um i think it was a couple of weeks ago td bank was the worst offender as far as how the percentage of their revenue from they received from overdrafts it was like it was some astronomical number um and they've they've really um decided to at least uh, clean up their act a little. Um, TD Bank have, um, you know, they are, they're really basically going to be offering a uh, no overdraft account, but it does have a $4.95 monthly fee. Um, so not sure. I mean, they got to be able to come up with some, um, <laughs> you know, some hook for get people to pay $4.95. But I don't know whether this is a marketing stunt and they just want to say, hey, we're doing something. Or whether they're actually serious. So, what, what do you guys think? I, mean, I I'd been a TD customer, and you can turn that functionality on and off in terms of you know whether it you allow it to go overdraft or or not. 
So it it, it feels like they've had this already. Um, you know, I, I, I think the other move they did is probably a bit more impactful, which is raising the um, you know the threshold to ten dollars versus five. Um, though you know, I'm sure people overdraft more than ten dollars, and that they can't do more than three charges in a day versus five charges. But this still overall the TD move felt less dramatic versus some of the other stuff like PNC and and some of the other smaller banks did, which to me felt a lot more innovative. This still feels more old bank that they were wanted to do something but didn't want to change too much. Yeah, I totally agree with that assessment, Todd. And, you know, well, glad you guys picked this topic. There's another one I wrote about, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of weeks ago on my yeah, I read that uh, Snark one, yeah. Tank blog, mm -hmm. you know, and my point there was, uh, you know, I, I thought it was it's getting to be sort of a political hot potato. Uh, and a lot of, you know, obviously in the uh, uh, Senate hearings a couple of weeks ago, Elizabeth Warren was uh, lecturing the, the, the bankers around overdraft fees. Uh, and I, my stake on this was, you know, I, I think some of these large banks have to, you know, put some stake in the ground simply from a political perspective and, you know, may, may end up uh, resulting in lower revenues from a, from an overdraft perspective, but it beats getting it regulated out of existence. In fact, I think there is a Democratic either representative or senator who's got a bill that's uh, yep. either out there or going to be out there. I'm not quite sure of the status of it that uh, is proposing to, I think, eliminate overdraft fees. And that's, that's, you know, it's never good when the government steps in for these kinds of things, because there's always a lot of unintended consequences as they never think through anything beyond the, the first step and the, you know, and maybe I'm getting a little too uh, critical of them on, on that, because I'm sure they'll argue that point. But, uh, you know, my point was that, you know, some of them are going to have to make the, uh, at least the the show of it to say that they're a lot more friendly to these consumers who are overdrawing so so uh, frequently. Plus, the reality of that, um, you know, the, the cost of it just is out of line with what their real, you know, internal costs are. Right. Uh, and so that's that's where you, you get into a situation where you can't defend the fee. Uh, you can defend the logic of having a fee because it really is a short-term loan mm -hmm. but if you start doing calculations on the, the the interest rate on that quote loan then it's just out of the ballpark ridiculous yeah no i, I did it was like eighteen thousand percent if you overdraw by ten dollars and you have a 35 dollar fee and you pay it back within seven days i i did the calc i think i think those 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 variables are correct and it was eighteen thousand two hundred and fifty percent and that you know, there, there should be an uproar about that. And I think, I mean, in your column, I remember when you, you said that really when, when Chase does this, then we'll, um, then, then it will be serious. And that's well, what, my take, I thought, was if somebody like Chase did that, everybody else would have to get into yeah. line, especially right. the community banks and the credit unions, because mm -hmm. especially the credit unions who position themselves as being more consumer friendly. And look, reality is, is that practically every one of them has an overdraft fee. Maybe it's a dollar or two or three dollars cheaper than what the large banks are offering, but it's still out there. And, and if Chase were to say, "Hey, we're going to eliminate this," then it, it really puts the, a lot of the community banks and the credit unions yeah. on their high, you know, on their uh, on their heels to to respond to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's coming. I mean, it, like, like it feels like there's overdraft news every week. It's why we said we've been covering it for a while. And, uh, you know, you wrote about it and many other people, the financial brand wrote about it. This, there's been a lot of press about it. Does this think, just go away or does this or does this build? That's the question. I mean, I think you can also connect some of the other moves JP Morgan has made to some of this in terms of, you know, that they need to find other sources of um you know, to, to fill the hole that the overdraft is going to leave. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's all interconnected. Um, I ultimately think overdrafts stay, though they're readjusted. Um, and this is also another place where fintech has that really pushed uh, banks to, to change their policy with, with fees and, and overdrafts, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but ultimately, I don't think the congressional aspect ends up happening i think they'll probably fall yeah. a bit short especially in the senate um, but i do think overdrafts stay to a certain capacity they're just overhauled um yeah. and so 
you know, uh, the big bank like Chase maybe um, does something a bit more um, dramatic, but I think a lot of the other banks will keep it in some capacity. And hopefully it's more the innovative way of like the region's way versus the TD way. Right. 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 Okay, let's move on. I want to talk about your uh, article this week, uh, Ron, in Forbes, talking about Walmart and their money card. Uh, they've now, it's basically the money cards changing from just really a prepaid card to a full on, um, you know, checking account with, with overdraft protection. Um, and yeah, your point was that really, you know, I think you've read, you've re you wrote about this previously was that, you know, Walmart's really looking to become a super app. And I think I, I heard you on, uh, I don't know what, what, where it was, or some sort of webinar where you really went into some depth about this. I thought it was uh, really interesting that Walmart, Walmart, um, have many of the th many of the tools in place. They're building and they're building. This is not even yeah. You know, they're building their fintech um, offering with the guys from Goldman Sachs leading it. And uh, I uh, yeah. I mean this is this is a uh, Walmart is the is the is the company to watch. I think and, and clearly it seems like uh, well you 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 your 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 title was does it matter? So does it matter? No. Um... <laughs> N not from a bank competitive perspective. Uh, you know, one of the things that got me to write this, I did write a couple months ago about uh, when when uh, it was announced that that uh, uh, Walmart had uh, had a partnership with Ribbit Capital and had hired two guys out of Goldman Sachs. That's when I wrote about the super apps. What got me to write about it this week was it, it seems like every time Walmart does something banking related, the press goes up, 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 apoplectic, whatever the word is, you know, I could probably spell it better than I can say it, but they go off the rails about how the bank of Walmart is coming and ooh, the banks have to look out. Look, reality is, is that Walmart's been in banking for what, 20 plus years now already? Yep, I mean, this yep. is not like a new thing that they're getting into. And uh, you know, they've had this, these, a wide set of financial they were in tax preparation, bill pay, money transfers, remittances, uh, as well as the prepaid card space for, for a long time. So what got me to kind of write about this was to, you know, just kind of say, will you stop this, you know, knee jerk reaction every time, um, you know, Walmart does something in financial services. Uh, but I, uh, I don't think it, the switch from prepaid card to, to full fledged checking account really matters that much from a consumer perspective um, because I think the consumers that they're attracting are consumers that want the prepaid debit card. The fact that now Walmart will offer a product that has overdraft goes back to our last conversation. Do you really think Doug McMillan at Walmart wants to be called in front of uh, <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth Warren asking him why they charged their customers $800 million this year, you know, in the past year on overdraft, which is potentially, you know, what they could be be doing or even even a half or a quarter of that. They, they don't want that political stuff. No, what they're doing, I think, is, is actually, you know, part of their broader fintech strategy is they want this, I think, from to be able to leverage the deposits from a lending perspective not to compete at the checking account level with community banks and credit unions. I think they're looking at what Amazon is doing. I think they're looking at what Square is doing. I think they look at even outside of the US and, and look at WeChat and Alipay and Ant and so forth and say, you know, we need to have a financial services capability that underpins a much broader set of services as I wrote a couple of months ago, guys, I, I can't imagine that the two guys from Goldman Sachs, you know, that they went over to, to Walmart on the pitch. Hey, you guys just spent five years building Marcus. Come on down to Bentonville, Arkansas and do it all over again. Right. <laughs> They're not <laughs> reacting to that. No, the pitch was, hey, guys, come, you know, we're going to build something much bigger to serve the low to middle income consumer, consumer market in this country. We're going to do something that's going to be so impactful and beneficial to this segment. Why don't you guys get on board for that? And that's the kind of thing they're going to leave Goldman Sachs for, not to build the bank of Walmart. So does it matter in the short term, short view in terms of competing with banks? No, this is not Walmart. This is not the game Walmart's playing. And also Walmart's not really, it, 
you know the the customer as you mentioned is not really the chase city type customer no it, it's more the 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 fintech that they are actually a bigger threat to fintechs who are trying to serve the underbanked yeah, than so they are Dave, to China yeah, Dave and, uh, th that's guys. who they're really and and there's a reason why the amazons the googles and those are not getting banking charters the same that you know walmart doesn't need a banking charter I mean, they you, they don't want to become that regulated entity that's being hauled in front of uh, Elizabeth Congress and others in, um, <laughs> you know, in the halls of Congress. So I agree with you. Um, I think it's, you know, that this certainly is is playing towards that super app. And I think if I'm a low to, to middle income earner, I'm happy for options like this because finally we're getting served better because the big banks are not coming to us at any point in the future. You know, this is what, if I can jump in, Todd, Peter, sure. there's one other point that I really think gets overlooked here, and it's one of these points that bugged the hell out of me, is it's always positioned as, you know, what Walmart's doing is a threat to banks. Well, I imagine Green Dot is sitting there going, eh, it's pretty good for us. Right. Green Dot is a bank. <laughs> they acquired Bonneville. They got a banking license. They are a bank. Yep. And you know what? To the other thousands of community banks out there, you could have been the bank supporting Walmart. You could have done it. You could have gone into business with them. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, a number of, uh, you know, well, I don't know that a number have tried, but, um, you know, that's, I think, overlooked point is that there is a bank that is underlying this that makes it all perfectly legal. There's, you know, a license behind there and, and, and Green Dot benefits from this. And they learn a lot about serving the, the low to middle income consumer that they actually take to some of their other partners. So this sort of threat to the banks, it's like, no, it's a huge opportunity for at least one bank and could have been a huge opportunity to others, but yeah. that's not how they approach the business and they let it go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I do want to talk just uh, briefly about um, you know, another Goldman Sachs article. They they had basically, they've, they're hiring two new executives to run Marcus Pay. They want to beef up Marcus Pay. This is their buy now, pay later offering. Currently, they have JetBlue as a client. You can you can go in and sort of put your travel, um, but on on installments. Um, and you know, with this with 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 this this article is basically saying is that the they you know maybe you know, Goldman Sachs is seeing the the huge strides of uh, you know in, in Afterpay, Klarna, um, a firm that are really just crushing it over the last 12 months and they're probably thinking we want to we want to get in on that action and, and i thought that was that was a super interesting uh just thing to realize that they they're, they're trying to build that out it looks like yeah and the next wave of consumer credit is you know is is installments and it's it's almost i mean it's, it's already here but people are no longer just putting everything on a credit card they're just financing whatever purchase they need the vacation if it's a bunch of things from you know, uh, I see it. You know, if you get stuff from Yankee Candle, you can do it on Afterpay. I mean, almost anything can be an installment of ten, fifteen, twenty dollars if it's like a you know a fifty, eighty, hundred dollar purchase. It's you know, it's fascinating to see um, what can be um, essentially a, a you know a loan these days, a short term loan. Yep. Yeah. Two quick comments on this. One is for all the growth that Klarna and Afterpay and everybody else has had in this market. I think it's important to recognize that until really this year, the vast majority of that growth came from outside the U.S., uh, yep, Australia, yeah. Europe, and much bigger. Uh, I, based on my surveys and, and studies, uh, I estimated that last year there was about $24 billion worth of retail purchases made with buy now, pay later programs. And, and that's, that's a, a rounding error in terms of the five or so trillion dollars of total retail purchases. Uh, very, very popular with uh, millennials, a little less popular with the Gen Zers, and practically off the map with uh, Gen Xers and, 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 and baby boomers. Uh, but I did do a study that I haven't even published results on this yet. And based on that, I, I, my initial estimate is that uh, it's going to grow about four to five X this year in the U.S. Wow. Um, a lot more millennials picking it up, but a lot more growth in the Gen Z market as, as well. Uh, so there is, there is a lot going on there. And uh, but it's getting to be a tough market. Uh, you, know, yeah. you, you know, I think we're going to start to see a lot more specialization from these providers you know, where some will specialize, let's say, in luxury goods, other more in general e-commerce. 
But you know, guys, I think got to, people got to not overlook that. You know, there's especially now when we get into home repairs, you need a new water heater. That's a great opportunity for for buy now, pay later. Um, and I was talking with a firm recently who's getting into the the healthcare space. You know, especially with like uh, dental payments and things that are you yeah. know off insurance. Um, so th there's huge, huge opportunities, and not all of it actually cannibalizes the credit card payments because you know a lot of these things outside are, um, you know, things that we wouldn't have thought of as sort of traditional payments. Yep, there's a lot, lot of room to grow there. I, I completely agree. I, I'm just astounded. I, 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 I uh, was in the in the market for a whole bunch of uh, camping gear. We went backpacking a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I, I bought a whole bunch of new stuff because our stuff was like 20 years old. And everywhere I went, when I was in these in these e-commerce sites, it was either Klarna, Afterpay, or Affirm. Pretty much everywhere. These are like hundred, two hundred dollar purchases, so they're really up there, up right up their alley. Just uh, the e-commerce space is getting more and more, um, more and more sort of in the in the wheelhouse of these buy, buy now pay later companies. But anyway, we are out of time. That is all we have time for this week um ron thank you very much for coming on really appreciate it todd it's always a pleasure yep. um thanks we ron. Will, we'll be back uh same time next week have a great long weekend everybody yep happy fourth yep thanks guys okay